Good, good way to wake up. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for your hospitality. Jeff in, invited me into his home last night, which is really extraordinary. And I do feel some kinship uh, here. As was noted, my uh, half of my family uh, hails from Kentucky, so and my mom never lost her Kentucky accent, even though we grew up in Vermont. So I'm delighted to be in Louisville for the first time and to talk to you about this future uh, and present, as was said, what, one of the fun things about this talk, this uh, talk was inspired by a book, which I'll mention in a minute. The, the crafting of the book was about 2014, and the book was released in October of 2015. So most of 2015 we worked on, on this book. And so many of the things we talked about as uh, part of the future are now already happening, which really is extraordinary given how fast-paced these changes are happening. So this is about Internet of Things, and what kicked the whole thing off was that I was driving home one day. I get a lot of inspiration uh, from NPR, actually, uh, for various things I do, blog posts, uh, talks, etc. And I heard this factoid that really struck me that by 2020 there will be over 20 billion everyday objects that we now think of as inanimate, but they will be connected by the Internet of Things. They'll have sensors in them, they'll communicate with one another, they'll communicate with their environment. And I thought, well, that sounds extraordinary, first of all, but secondly, that's got to change the way we deliver care. Now, this predates the Nest thermostat. People know about the Nest thermostat? People here have a Nest thermostat, a few of you? It predates Amazon's Echo, like that's really popular now, right? Those are both Internet of Things applications, so that you get a sense that if you use a number of mobile apps, uh, when you wander into, I do anyway, when I wander into CVS, four or five coupons pop up, or Staples, same thing. They know your, their context of where, they know where you are because of the GPS locator on your phone. So there's a lot of really interesting things happening now that we, we projected would happen and happening in retail and happening in other sectors. But it's going to affect healthcare delivery as well. And that's really what I want to talk to you about today. So indeed, in 2015, we published this book. I want to mention a couple of things. Uh, this is, I know, CN, CME anathema to be showing your own book. I promise you, none of the revenues from this book come to me. They all go directly to my department. We self-publish this book, so the, it's not, I'm not enriching myself in any way by mentioning the book. Further, I'm going to mention a number of companies during the talk. None of them uh, I have any personal financial relationship with. We do have a customer relationship with one, and I'll mention that at the time uh, when we get to that. That is to say, Partners Healthcare is a customer of one of these companies that I'm going to talk about. was not when we wrote the book, incidentally. So... To try to make this concept of Internet of Things and how it will affect healthcare a little more vibrant for you, I want to start by taking you into the future. And again, it's interesting that this was a five-year future when we first wrote about this. Some of the things that we talked about in this future are already happening. I'll have some examples of that as we go through. But my, the way this future works is it's uh, about five years hence, my uh, employer has offered me the opportunity to take a premium discount for a service that offers me a uh, virtual health coach. And his name is Sam. You're going to meet Sam in a minute. And... Uh, the idea there is that I've traded a lot of personal information. You'll see this because Sam knows a lot about me in order to help guide me to a, the proper healthy state. But I've traded that information for lower premium costs. So that's one thing you should know. The other thing you should know about Sam before we introduce him is he's very strict, rigorous, almost like a drill sergeant. And that's on purpose because I know that's what motivates me. And if that's off-putting to you, don't worry. This can be designed in a way that motivates you. Part of this future is getting things so they're very, very personalized. Something else you see going on uh, in retail as well. So without further ado, take us a few years hence. It's a fall day. 
I'm waking up in the morning, and the first thing that I get is a message from Sam. Good morning, Joe. Here's the tale of the tape. Your blood pressure and cholesterol are fine. Your sleep deficit is now up to three hours a week. You put on two pounds since last month, and your activity level has fallen short of your goal by 25%. You need more sleep, and you need more exercise. If you're going to get into that size 40 tuxedo for Julie's wedding in March. 140 days to go, and count it. Get moving, Val. I forgot to mention that my daughter doesn't know she's getting married five years since. Uh, she, she agreed to go along for the, for the sake of the presentation. So you get a sense of what this is like. Now, Sam is trying to give me some choices, right? He wants, rather than have me show up looking like this at my daughter's wedding, rather more James Bond-like, right? More svelte. That's a challenge, as you all know. We're surrounded by all kinds of ways to go off the, the uh, task. The other thing I want to mention about that first set of messages, nothing in that is future. It wasn't future when the book came out. This is all screenshots from my own mobile device of wearables and things in my environment that can connect. As you all know, we can connect these now. We can display them on one screen because of APIs and the like. So all of this is happening and could indeed inform Sam. Well, I got went, had my breakfast this, this day in the, in the future. I, off I go to work, about three hours of morning meetings. Many of you can relate to that, I'm sure. Not much activity, and I'm going around the block after lunch, a, a meager lunch, I'm, I'll add, and Sam messages me again as I'm walking outside. Hey, Joe, hey. I can see you're on the move. My guess is you're walking toward Pache's Bakery for a chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> Sounds good, but a reminder, if you eat that cookie, it will set you back in the goal of getting into that tuxedo. Why not use the extra calories to have a glass of red wine with dinner tonight? And may I recommend the Monte Pucciano, the root? Well, we didn't get the wine algorithm just right. I probably would go with a Napa Cabernet, but, but I do enjoy wine with dinner, and, and I probably would have had the glass of wine anyway. So based on Sam's recommendation, I walked around the block again, I did not get the cookie, and I went back to another two or three hours of inactivity, meetings and whatnot, and then as I'm wrapping up my day, I get one more message. Joe, have you thought about taking up swimming again? I have a coupon from the Boston Sports Club, just two blocks from the office. A six-month membership, half price. On top of that, there are five other people that your online social network considering the opportunity. I also see three time slots each week. You could be at least one of them for a swim. Don't pick up your mind by right now. Think it over. Well, once again, you can see how that's a feasible thing that could happen with today's technologies. It's, it's easy to see how I could give uh, permission to look at my Facebook. I am right, actually. My office is a, a stone's throw from Boston Sports Club. You can see how the coupons can be flagged because, again, we've all seen this happen now with Starbucks, with, with uh, uh, CVS and the like. So this is possible. This is possible. Now... I haven't swam uh, for exercise since I was in medical school, so I have to really think this one over before I make any of those decisions. But as I am thinking, one more message comes in, this time from my daughter. So you can see they've kind of got me from all sides here. And that's kind of the point of what motivates me. Now, we're not at this future yet. Although, as I said, as we speak, there are health plans that are offering people, uh, in exchange for wearables data, lower premium costs. Some of this is happening, but we're, we're, not, we're not quite there yet. And, and again, some of the artificial intelligent chatbots and things that have come up in the last two or three years make this even look like it's right around the corner. So what's missing? What do we got? Well. This future is about incentives. It's about some behavioral economic principles. You notice that Sam never talked to me about the fact that if I don't get in shape, I'll die in 10 years of a heart attack. It was much more localized to something that I care about, which is looking good for my daughter's wedding. A lot of interesting principles of psychology, and we'll walk through some of those as we go through the talk. 
So, but we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Maybe it's right around the corner, but we're not there yet. What do we need to do to get there? And that's really what I want to spend my time with you on this morning. And I break it up into three groups, three areas of innovation, three things that we need to get better at before we can realize that future. And the first is about the things themselves. What's happening in the world of the Internet of Things? What do we need to do to uh, get that, that sort of data that I talked about so that it actually makes sense. Nowadays you can, uh, I have a Nokia scale. Oh, I've, I've had, since they were Withings, I've had one of their scales for eight years now. I can track my weight back uh, eight years. I have used some sort of activity tracker for that same amount of time and if I was meticulous, I could put my uh, intake, calorie intake into an app like my fitness pal, right? So I should be able to get Calories in, calories out, and weight. Those should all relate. But, and I can display them on the same screen, but they don't tell a story. That's kind of one, where we need to go with the things part. And then there's the analytics in the middle. Once I get all that information about you, what I've got to do with it is create a unique persona that's you. That's not the person next to you or the person to your other side, but you. We'll talk a little bit about that and how we're not quite there yet. And then finally, the most important part, in my estimation, this, this uh, belies my, my clinical background, is the engagement part. Once I know everything about you, if I can't engage you in a meaningful way for behavior change, then that's kind of useless. So let's go through each. Again, the first one is about this idea of what do we do with all the data from the things? It's data aggregation, normalization, and some things about how the wearables industry is going. So first on the data aggregator side, there are some efforts underway. As I said, I, I can display all those data points. I can't make sense out of them. There's a couple of companies that are working on this. One of them is Validic, and this is the company that I said I would mention that we, Partners Healthcare, have a relationship with. There are uh, our un, uh, technology underneath our data, patient-generated data story. I'll tell you that story momentarily. And what they are is uh, largely they've taken all of these APIs that all of these devices have and they've just aggregated them. And, and it's a, there's a very useful uh, set of functions that they've done and, and it makes it very easy for us to move to a world where we can now invite our patients, a clinician in our system can invite, can invite a patient who happens to have a wearable to share his or her wearable data and then see it in the context of their medical record. That's, we have that happening now. That's, uh, that is pretty cutting edge because we don't know how many people actually, how many clinicians really want that. It's turning out that there are a number of interesting use cases between uh, activity monitoring for groups of people with type 2 diabetes to blood pressure monitoring in the home. That's a big one. Uh, some some number of things going on where clinicians are saying, oh, I'd love to use that. And as you can imagine, a number of researchers using this kind of technology to <clears throat> in studies. So this is brand new. We've just rolled it out. It's pictured in this slide. And uh, and I would, please don't try to read it. The, I've got to go back and edit the, the uh, text. But the text isn't important here. It's the idea that on the bottom you see how uh, between a, a person's uh, device and their mobile phone, and then we have technology to get it in and display it into the electronic record. That's the point of this. So we'll see how this goes, and uh, we're very excited to learn about what bring, bring your own device means in clinical medicine, uh, but it's just the beginning. And we've done this at, on the top of the diagram is what we used to do, which we had a formal program. We would give people a blood pressure cuff, we would give them a hub device, which you see pictured there, that's the Qualcomm to net hub and that and we had the same channel into our electronic record and we've gotten away from that because it's very costly managing inventory it's hard actually to do an ROI around something like blood pressure management when when you have this all this technology that you're providing the patient so we're going to see how bring your own device works and that's an example of how we're using a, a, a technology like validic the other main player in the space, which probably nobody here has heard of, I would guess, is Human API. They're really, really a background player. A lot of health plans use them. A lot of other organizations use them to aggregate different data sets like claims data and the like, and they can do wearables data as well. 
So that's a little bit about the data aggregation problem. No one has solved the problem yet of making those data software-wise, kind of normalizing them and making them make sense because they're all slightly different and that's a challenge. So that's an opportunity for someone. On the sensor side, just briefly want to talk about how they're, we're going from an era where the information that you get from a wearable is a number. You've all, I'm sure, had at least experiences with things like Fitbits or bathroom scales that are connected. We're going from that kind of thing. And by the way, in the beginning, we all thought that was terrific because, well, I'm a quantitative person, so I'm really excited to look at my step count and change my behavior. Most of our patients are not. Most of our patients are not quantitative. Most of them are not self-motivated or they wouldn't have chronic illness, right? So we're moving into an era where these things show insight as opposed to just a number. Muse is one example. That's a wearable headset that measures EEG. Now, there may be a neurologist or two in the audience. I don't want to offend you, but that's a boring tracing, right? But what they turn it into is advice on meditation, advice on stress, advice on uh, mindfulness. And that's interesting to people. Spire is a similar, this is a uh, belt-worn device that measures respiration. Once again, if you're a respiration person, I'm going to offend you by saying that's kind of boring. But... They turn it into, because guess what? Our respiratory rate varies when we're stressed, it varies when we're calm, it varies when we're focused, and they will give you feedback on that. Now, we've tested both of these, Muse and Spire. They both kind of work well. They have slightly different strengths and weaknesses, but they both do largely what they say they do. So it's interesting to see this kind of crop of wearables that's using a uh, basic bodily function to educate you about something about mindfulness. Empatica is another interesting company. They just got FDA approved. That wearable that you see on the young child's leg notifies the family 30 minutes before she's going to have a grand mal seizure. Pretty interesting stuff. Pretty interesting. If I had more time, I'd tell you how it all came about. It's one of those interesting serendipity studies. This is an MIT spin-out, so keep an eye on them because they think that's interesting. And then Proteus Digital Health, some of you may be aware of Proteus, they just signed a deal. So I'll tell you what they do, and they have a really interesting deal that we're all going to want to pay attention to. Proteus has, if you see on the bottom uh, middle, that little metallic thing on the tablet, that's a radio. And when you ingest that tablet and you wear the patch, which is on the bottom left, the, the radio hits uh, the HCL in your stomach and turns on and, sub, and transmits a signal to the patch that you've taken the pill. Now, so that's real-time adherence. That may be interesting in and of itself, but it also allows, because the patch measures ECG, it measures respirations, it measures heart rate activity, so it allows people to measure the physiologic response to something you ingest. Pretty interesting. Now, they've been around for about 10 years, God bless them, but they finally signed a deal of all things with Otsuka, and now there's a tablet on the market in the supply chain called Abilify MySight, and you can prescribe Abilify with this radio in it, and your uh, patients may be, will be able to uh, check their, or you'll be able to check their um, adherence as, as they take the drug. More and more of this to come. So we're gone, we've gone from wearables with numbers to wearables that give insight to ingestibles. It's a really interesting time in the sensor space. Well, what's left? Well, as I said, normalization is a big one. Normalization is a big one. Anybody who's an engineer in the audience who wants to go off and form a company, that would be an interesting thing. Uh, frictionless data capture, we're getting there. We're getting there. That means that we, we have what's called wear and forget, right? I shouldn't have to... Bluetooth anything, I shouldn't have to enter any data, I shouldn't have to think about anything, it should just happen. That's how Sam would get to know all things about me because those data just flowed. Well, we're not quite there yet, as any of you know who've used these devices. There's some work involved. When there's work involved, usually patients drop out and the patients that you want to monitor the most drop out first because they don't want to do the work. So we need to get better at that. And then better and better electronic record integration. We're proud of our electronic record integration, but it's just a screen that shows the blood pressure readings from home. 
next to the electronic record. They're not integrated with the readings from the office. They don't have any way of telling a story what the home readings mean versus the off, none of that. So we want to get better and better at all of those. So that's the sensor part. Let's talk a little bit about the middle, the analytics, which frankly analytics is now a, a term that's quite outmoded. The, the term du jour is artificial intelligence, as I'm sure most of you know. We went from uh, big data to data machine learning to deep learning. All within a couple of years, we're, we're all of a sudden we're at this, our AI is the big deal and it's scary to a lot of docs, uh, but it has to happen. <laughs> I probably should have mentioned this in the beginning. I'm going to mention it at the end again. We're running out of doctors and nurses, guys. There's more and more chronic illness, and we're not training people fast enough. We actually couldn't train them fast enough because of the rate of rise of chronic illness and the rate as our society ages. So we have to figure this AI thing out. So in the middle, there's this analytic engine. Now, a lot of companies are pretty proud of what they do. I, I can think of uh, Amazon recommending books or Netflix recommending movies and things like that. You've all experienced those kinds of analytic engines at work. But when it comes to health behaviors, we're a little bit, frankly, behind. So here's a couple of quotes from the book uh, on the state of the art of predictive analytics in healthcare. The first comes from a guy who made a, a, a fortune selling a company that did this. And let me just read it, I don't typically read, but a sudden uptick in how often family members contact their health plan about caregiver support and the available benefits is often a good indicator of a pending acute risk. Do we need an AI agent to tell us that, right? Is that obvious, right? What? That's the best we can do. Another uh, colleague, friend who who's quoted uh, in the book says, the magazines that you read, Runner's Daily or Barbecue Daily, tell us a lot about you. I kind of like to barbecue, right? So does that make me somehow unhealthy? I I'm not sure. So I don't think we're very good at this. And I think the, the point here is that if indeed you take that same kind of, you know, the Amazon or the uh, uh, other algorithms, the Netflix, are based on a hundred people like Joe, you know, if, if a hundred people like this and they're like Joe, Joe might like it. But health has to be very much more individualized than that. We can't get away with that. If I recommend a behavior to you that's a healthy behavior that's out of context, you'll shut it down. And we've seen this over and over with patients over the years. So we have to get better. Let me tell you one story from our own work that gives me some hope. Uh, this is a story about an analytic engine that we created. And the context here was type 2 diabetes. And we asked the question if over a six month period of time by automating some messages to folks with type 2 diabetes, could we change their behavior? And the behavior we were looking at was activity uh, and, and as a secondary uh, outcome, A1C. So could we change physical activity and could we, could we lower hemoglobin A1C without human intervention using a data algorithm? Here's how we did it. We took four inputs, and I'll share them with you now. The first was a psychology input, readiness to change. It's uh, uh, the trans-theoretical model. How, where are you on that journey of being interested in actually improving your behavior? That's something we measured. Then, of course, there was a wearable. Uh, it's activity, we can measure activity, that makes sense. Constantly feeding in wearables data. The third, was location data, not this kind of sophisticated thing I was talking about before with knowing about the Boston Sports Club and what have you, just some basic location data. I know where your home is, I know where your doctor's office is. And the fourth was weather. Weather turns out to be a very powerful a data stream. It's free, it's available, and it relates to activity uh, in a very powerful way. So every day those four data streams were coming in to the engine and it would fire off one unique customized to those again four four data streams customized message that was inspirational in to improve walking behavior and after six months again with no human intervention I want to keep emphasizing that we had lower a1c significantly lower than the control group improved step counts from those patients 
Now there was a, a cohort who didn't respond. So there's a, there, not not at all perfect. Got a lot of work to do with it, but but we were able to change behavior without human intervention. And I think again that there's power in that if we can get that right. You're all really busy. If we can offload a little bit of that coaching that you do in the office that you don't have enough time to do anyway to something like this, I think that might be really, really interesting. Well, as it turned out, we published this paper. Samsung was hanging around at the time. They picked up the intellectual property. They turned it into a mobile app. They added a lot of more rich data features. It's, it's now much more modern, much more state-of-the-art. And we've just finished, just finished a clinical trial uh, on this using for multiple chronic illnesses. So I, I don't have those data We're because we're just starting to do analysis now. But it's interesting, and Samsung may very well commercialize it. They're, they're looking very carefully at that. And you may see this as part of the S Health uh, suite of services in the coming months to years. So pretty interesting work. And again, just the idea that, well, maybe we can do analytics in a way that will actually change behavior. So again, those of you who are perhaps interested in this and want to focus on this, here's the thing, is you can't do it like Amazon and Netflix does it if it's going to be helpful. It has to be about you, one individual, and we have to get it a little bit better, a little bit sharper than what we're currently doing out there. Well, I save what I think is the best for last because, again, if I know everything about you, I have all that data about you, I've nor figured that normalization thing out, I've got it so that you actually, I, I know everything about you, but if I can't message you in a way that's compelling, it's not going to be very useful. And so we have this whole engagement piece. And engagement is complicated, it's the holy grail. Most of the companies that are out there selling services to health plans are or, or uh, uh, employers are trying to crack this nut. They have rates of engagement that go from 8% to 50% sometimes. 50% sounds good, but that means 50% didn't. So it's a real challenge. And there's a chapter in the book about this. I won't have time to go over it in great, great detail. But it, it sort of goes with three strategies. Make it about life. Make it personal and reinforce social connections. So you saw that Sam employed all three of those, if you think back to Sam. The make it about life was this thing about my daughter's wedding. The make it personal was the very personalized, knowing where I was, all my data, whether I was near Boston Sports Club, that I was perhaps going to get a cookie, all that's very personal. And then the social connection, my daughter comes in at the tail end to seal the deal and say, thanks for doing all that, I've been watching, I could tell you didn't eat the cookie. Very powerful stuff. And then three tactics, which are subliminal messaging, unpredictable rewards, and the sentinel effect. I don't have time to go through every single one of these, but I'm going to walk through now some examples of most of them uh, as we uh, come to the tail end of the conversation. Make it about life. So I've told you that, that uh, this was part of uh, Sam's strategy. We, we ran a little thing with um, activity trackers and we quizzed people about them. And I've actually done this in my own practice anecdotally uh, where people come in and, of course, I only see people who have something dangling on their wrist, right? Because I don't see the people who threw them in the drawer. So I, I know it's a, it's a, there's some sample bias there, but I'll say, gee, I see you're wearing an activity tracker. What do you think of it and why? And almost everyone says I'm in some kind of competition with a loved one. It's really interesting. And so this idea that it's part of your daily life, it's, it's part of your family rubric, I think makes a big difference. And that's what this graph shows, that people that were engaged with activity tracking, 80% of them uh, had uh, a family member involvement. So that's you could say that's social too, right? These things overlap, but it's definitely about making it a core part of your daily life. Make it personal. This is a really interesting story of an app we created. So this is another kind of one-to-many story. This is an app we created for cancer pain management in collaboration with a palliative care service at the Mass General Hospital. And the problem that many of you, I'm sure, know is that people who are near death, they're in, they're in uh, palliative care situations, they're in hospice, they're managing cancer pain. In the context of this opioid 
crisis that we're in. There's a lot of ambivalence. There's a lot of concern. Am I overusing? Am I underusing? Some people think that, that pain means that their body's fighting the cancer, so they shouldn't medicate. It, it, t- it could take an hour of your time to go through all that, and our, our oncologists don't have that kind of time. I'm, I'm sure yours don't either. And so you, you give the patient a prescription and give them some, some parameters. You can take one to four a day or one to two, three every six hours or what have you, and people get perplexed. So we created an app that's both engaging. You can see the front screen here. It's checking their pain score. It's advising them based on their pain score what to do next. It checks in in a couple of hours as your pain better. It has a lot of educational content. But the thing I want to drive home most about this experiment was that there were many places inside the app where you could push a button and be connected directly to the palliative care service at the Mass General. So we're not putting technology between the patient and the doctor. We're actually giving the patient an option to self-care until they really feel like they need the doctor. We built that in on purpose, and we studied that. We also studied whether interacting with this app had any impact on pain management. And here's the thing. Compared to a control group, the people who use the app call the doctor less. But I'll show you their pain scores here. And that's the green line. Their pain was significantly improved over the period of the study compared to a control group. So better outcomes with less human involvement. Again, that's a theme that I want to keep driving home. We have to get there. right? So if you employ these things in a, in a smart way, I think we can make some big differences. And this one is very personalized, and that's why I put it under the category of make it personal. Social, that's another fun one. So now just about any app that you get for any purpose has social built in, it has gamification built in, right? It has like a lot of notifications. These things are done because there's a science of, of app developer engagement that makes these things addictive on your phone. And we did this before. This study was done a little while ago, and it was done on Facebook. But we were having struggling. Our, pedi- our pediatricians, particularly the pediatric pulmonologists, were struggling with this idea that the kids don't collaborate with them and fill out the uh, ACT test, right, which is a really good predictor of, of uh, future bad events in asthma. And that's something that when we're at risk for those kids, we want to know. So adherence to the ACT was about 18% when we did it in various ways, put it in the waiting room, asked people to fill it out. It was just abysmal. So we said, well, maybe what we can do is... Put, put it in Facebook. So we, we formed a private Facebook group for these teenagers with asthma. Now, mind you, our goal was to get them to fill out the survey. That's what the goal was. And the data showed that, by golly, their asthma got better just because we put them in a group together on Facebook, as, as good as an, an, a new inhaler, right? So... Really interesting stuff that happens with these things. I can't explain this except somehow, and we didn't really have any, very little oversight when we, when we put this together. The kids said, please don't put a doctor in the group. We won't do anything. So we were very hands off and we formed this group and we just, again, we just wanted them to fill out the ACT, but by keeping their asthma top of mind and having them share things about it, somehow that their asthma improved. Really interesting stuff. Really interesting stuff. Subliminal messaging. So that's a weird one. And what that means is, is uh, if, if I am able to get my, this is very reproducible, by the way, if I'm able to get my health message underneath something you really care about. So I cared about, in my story, looking good for my daughter's wedding. And all the health messaging was around that, right? Because that's what I cared about. I didn't care about the fact that, again, I might die of a heart attack in 10 years if I didn't get my cholesterol and gear or something. That's not the way. We, we all message our patients, I think, the wrong way. We use fear. We try to use fear. We try to use intimidation. We, try to, we think that education is inspiration. None of that. None of that, right? So what we did here was this is chemotherapy, uh, uh, oral chemotherapy app for adherence. Well, the first thing that happened was when we went to design this, and we do this when we design everything, we, we got a bunch of 
cancer patients together to talk about how we would design it. And they were offended that we would even think that they needed an app to improve their adherence to their oral chemotherapy. Of course, you all know they do. There's a challenge there, right? But these people were like, God, this is cancer, man. Of course I'm going to take my pills. So we designed it to do everything but. And then, by the way, we reminded them to take their pills, and it worked very effectively. That's subliminal messaging, something you can think about uh, as you think about how you interact with your patients. One of my favorites is Sentinel Effect, because we own that. You know, the, there's a world here where CVS is offering services, uh, uh, Walgreens is offering services, your health plans around you are offering services. Who's, who owns the patient? Who owns the relationship in this brave new digital world? Well, you, you and I both own this, which is our patients, when they know we care about something, a data point or something they're doing, they pay close attention. Uh, the, the, the two examples here, just for a quick fun moment, the one on the left, and these are both real, the one on the left is a cutout policeman that was placed near a bike rack at one of our subway stops in the Boston area, and bike theft went down. <laughs> I don't know, you know, just think about it, right? That's the sentinel effect. When you know you're being watched, you behave differently. The one on the right is even more fun. Now, this, I know, rural uh, uh, territory around here, so probably some of you have come in contact with these. It's called a, a dynamic speed display, right? You're driving down, and it flashes your speed, which is usually higher. Um, and most of us slow down, right? Why do you slow down? There's not a policeman hiding in that thing. <laughs> But it's this idea that, oh, you know, they're signaling you that they know. So that's the sentinel effect, and we own that. Your patients care very much what you think about their behavior, right? Now let me just share an example of that. So this is congestive heart failure telemonitoring, something we've been doing now for almost 15 years. And, and there's a lot of reasons this works well. Uh, there's, the, there's the feedback loop, there's educating patients about the fact that weight and fluid and salt are related. All that's a part of it. But one of the interesting things is we, we send them home with this technology, we, we actually have someone plug it in because it's still com complicated enough that it's not wear and forget yet. And then we say, please upload your vital signs every day and please answer these uh, questions, symptom questions, and then life goes on. Well. You know, as you can imagine, heart failure patients, there's a chunk of them that don't do that. Uh, and they will get a phone call the first morning at 10 a.m. and say, Mrs. Jones, we noticed you didn't upload. And all of a sudden, the uploads tick up, right? And they say things to us like, I don't want to disappoint the nurse, right? Uh, I, I, I keep my data and I keep my weight under control because I don't want to disappoint the nurse. That's the sentinel effect. We see that in all of our monitoring programs. You can blow it, by the way, as the doctor or, or the provider if you don't pay attention to the data and something happens. Like we have, as I said, we can get hypertension follow-up data in the medical record. So a real uh, buzzkill is when the patient comes in and, and they're with a the doctor and the doctor doesn't even mention they've been home monitoring. They, they tend to drop off after that. So it works in both directions. So what else can we do in innovation? There's a lot, uh, sorry, in, in, in uh, engagement, there's a lot going on. Well, there's a lot to be done. So the first is we don't design things very well for really, I mean, we could talk about electronic health records. You notice I, I haven't gone there. That's a, another hour's worth of uh, griping. But even for our patients, the way uh, things are designed in the mobile environment these days, like the, the games, the things, Snapchat, the things that are really addictive. We, we need to go there. We need to design things better for our patients and make it so dead simple to use what we need them to use that they, they don't have challenges. Again, we think complicated educational experiences are going to win the day. Simple things will win the day. So consumer-centric design, as I said, fitting into everyday life, that's a recurring theme here. Very, very important that we don't make it about some event 10 years down the road, not, not really going to resonate. Personalization, mention that as well. And then finally, the sentinel effect. The sentinel effect. Remember, guys, we own that. We own that. We should, we should leverage it. So, because CVS doesn't own that. I mean, I guess maybe they think the pharmacist cares, but you and I know they really think, they know, they, they care what you think. We should leverage that. 
this is why the last two slides really are about why you don't really have a choice. So I mentioned this earlier. I'm going to riff on it for a little bit now. By 2020, there will be, for the first time in history, more people over 65 than under 5. And that trend, now that we've passed that line, just keeps going. By 2050, twice as many people over 65 as under 5. We're running out of young people to take care of old people. We have to do something differently. This graph illustrates something. You, you, this is a physician graph. You can see it with nursing. All we offer people is a one-trick pony. If you're sick or you need care, come visit me in the office. One-to-one -one interaction in the office. No other service industry does it that way anymore. They're touching you through your mobile device. They're touching you in all sorts of different ways. We say, come in. I can fit you in Thursday at 3. Or the other bizarreness is you can come three months on Thursday at 3 and you don't need me then, but you, that's because you come in because you're scheduled and you needed me in the middle of it, but you couldn't get in. We need to change the way we do this, right? And these tools, these Internet of Things tools will be a big part of how we make that change. But it's going to be hard for us because we all think that, that the only way to deliver care is in the office. We've got to get beyond that. There's a bunch of other things in the future that uh, are going to drive that as well. There's things like consumerization. There's things like consumer-driven uh, 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 health plans, all kinds of things swirling around us that are bigger than all of us. But the one that we own is the fact that we're running out of doctors and nurses compared to the onslaught of chronic illness, and we have to embrace that. We have to start to think differently about how we provide care. So that's my story. Just again, to remind you of those three areas, there's the data, the, the things, the data aggregation, the normalization, the analytics, and the engagement piece. And those all need work. So if you're motivated and interested in moving this forward, we need you. This is not something that any one individual or any one startup is gonna solve. It takes a lot of people. We all own some of this because we need to sort of get a little bit more uh, open to these things and a little bit less stuck in our ways because the way we do it now is not going to happen for much longer. We can't keep saying, come in the office at three because that's all I have. We've got to get beyond that. All right. That's my contact information. And we have some time for questions. Thanks very much. Okay, so... Fascinating presentation. I'm Thank you. curious about when you share all this information, where does the health insurance company come in and say, oh, for the last 10 years, you've had, you haven't been paying attention to your blood pressure. I'm going to deny you cardiac care. Where does that come into this? Sure. So the question, uh, I'll paraphrase. The question is, is about insurance uh, maluse of, uh, of, of the state of my insurance companies to sort of deny coverage, right? Uh, I think there are statutes that prevent that, number one. So for now, that can't happen. Number two, um, I would say the, the U.S. is just, frankly, our, 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 it's not designed that way. Right? We, we're, we're a society where the opposite is true. You, you have the right to make yourself sick and we'll, stay care, we'll still take care of you. Um, but, but... I will share one example which I think illustrates a positive on that, which is the United Health Group has a plan called um, Motion. They, through their plan sponsors, so these are forward thinking employers that implement this, they give all employees a wearable and you're responsible, or, or you have three goals, I should say. They're called FIT frequency, uh, intensity, and tenacity. Uh, frequency is that you're supposed to get up at least every hour and move around. Intensity is, is you're supposed to get at least a 30-minute brisk walk in every day. And tenacity is your 10,000-step goal. And if you, each one of those will give you, if you meet it, will give you automatically a dollar back into your health savings account. And if you do all three, you get four bucks. That's interesting, right? I don't know. Again, we'll see how it goes, how long it goes, how they tweak it. They've been doing it for about a year. I haven't seen any published data on whether it's successful or not. But I know they have at least 300,000 people on the program, so we should get some interesting data from them. 
I see it moving more in that direction than the direction you mentioned. Yes, sir. For those of us who like, like you, who like to collect data, analyze it, and publish it, this is all wonderful. But moving on then to the practicing position, tremendous time step. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I hear you. Ver, I hear that pain. So I'd say a couple things on, on that. I guess one, one is uh, I started this work. This is just a coincidence, but just to frame the timing, I started doing this work in about 1994, and and at the time, I very much remember. Uh, we had voicemail and we had fax, and there was this new thing called email, and it was killing everyone because we now had three channels that people could bombard you with. So fast forward almost 25 years, and how many people get many faxes anymore, right? Almost none. Uh, my kids laugh if I leave them a voicemail. Dad, nobody listens to voicemail, right? So it's all become one channel. So I, I think we, we're in the beginning of that journey here where there's so many things bombarding clinicians. That's one thing. We'll, we'll get to the other side. The second, though, is that other industries have dealt with this by using software to take all those bits of information and create insight. And so we can do that, too. We just haven't had the, the business reason to do it yet. Well, someone will figure that out so that uh, you will get real decision support, right? Instead of getting a thousand normal blood pressure readings you'll get. This is what that in aggregate says about this person's blood pressure picture. And it'll be easy and it won't be bombarding. It'll fit into your workflow. Uh, so I think that's how that will get solved. So right now it is awful, but we'll get better. Thank you. You mentioned you're less worried about this because the United States is not designed this way, and you mentioned we should do things more individually and less like Amazon. Yet Amazon is getting into healthcare, and Facebook is a very large company that fractionates this according to political beliefs and any data they can get a hold of. These smaller companies that are collecting data on us, on us can easily be bought by these larger companies, and of course Amazon's already gone on record as to getting into healthcare industry. And it will certainly be algorithmically driven in terms of how they make decisions. So how do we march toward this brave future without evolving towards a social structure like China's now doing with regard to a social score that is in part going to be based on healthcare behaviors? That's an easy thing for an algorithmic society like ours now to be doing, even if the government isn't doing it, all the things that we use are doing it. So what checks and balances do you see that we can put into place to avoid that? It's a terrific question. This is a pretty cerebral crowd you got here. Uh, I, 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 so I, I, everything you said, I point taken, right? Um, I, I actually, though, just to slightly digress, the, the Amazon, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, and J.P. Morgan, we need stuff like that. We, we need stuff like that to happen because the people in this room, as far as I know, and I don't mean to dis again diss any of you, but at least where I work, we're we're not moving in that direction fast enough, right? It takes six months to make a decision on what the tablecloth looks like, so. <laughs> We need, we need a burning platform for us to change. So I, I, I actually welcome that. Now, the deeper question you had, um, it's possible that future could. I, I can't say that future won't happen. I do think, though, that between all of the sort of legal surroundings that we have of things like tort, of things like uh, uh, HIPAA, other kinds of environments that surround us make it, I would say, very difficult to imagine that future. Uh, again, I could be wrong, but it's possible. Uh, but I, I don't think it's going to happen that way. So you say that in the context of a country that has just had a presidential election that nobody would have envisioned could have been influenced by an online service like Facebook, and yet becomes increasingly clear was over a very short period of time. Do you really think that the aggregate of this data, as rapidly as it's expanding, won't be used for purposes like that? And if not, if you do, how can we think now about what checks and balances we can put into place to prevent that future? I think it's probably unwise for us to say things like it's probably unlikely. Yeah. It's more important for us to say, how can we change it now before it becomes a fait accompli? Well, uh, 
I think the other thing probably that comes to mind when with your with your question is uh, how, you know the, the the business model of handling data. So if you take the difference, let me try this one out on you between Apple and Google and how they handle data, right? So Apple makes it very uh, firewalled um, on purpose, and um, and 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 that's. So, you know, if we all got on that ecosystem, I think a lot of your concerns would be taken care of because it's very, like, you can't get into my phone, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Google, on the other hand, because they live on data, everything's open, right? Android's very open, everything's open. Now, the sad thing, and, I, and again, I don't know how to... So I'll say it this way. you get by, by walling everything off like that, you give up certain things, too. Google Maps is a much better product than Apple's Maps for a reason, because they have all of our data to inform the product. Um, so I, I don't, again, I don't, this deep philosophical question, I don't quite know how to answer it. But there are trade offs in both directions. I think we probably should move on. Yes? Okay, so a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is uh, you stated that um, somebody calls and says they're sick, you know, they need to, to us to address the issue, and our response is, well, I'll get you in next Thursday at 3. But I would submit to you that part of the reason for that is that that's the only way I can get paid. Yep. If, uh, you know, if somebody emails me or I talk to them on the phone, mm -hmm. I can't, I mean, I, I could spend hours, and I would have no problems doing that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I could use up all my time doing that and not get paid for doing anything. So I think that something would have to change in the way that we are reimbursed for the care that we provide. Yes. And I realize that, that, that people are thinking about this. The other question I have for you is anybody using this type of approach in any field other than medicine? That is to say, for example, at UPS, do they have these things out on all their workers that are loading boxes and saying, you know, if you load 10 more boxes today, you're going to beat so-and-so over here that doesn't do it? And if they are doing something like that, how is that working out for them? Uh, I, repeat, sorry. Yes, of course. So they're, they're, uh, I, I was happy to, to talk about the reimbursement part, which I will. Um, so, so there's it's a two part. The, there was a comment which really I'm going to turn into a question about reimbursement. That uh, part of the reason that we bring people in the office to to do things is because that's where the we can we can render a transaction. And absolutely agree with that. I'm happy to report that we're, we a number of us are working on that. I, I'm a co-chairing committee at the AMA called the Digital Medicine Payment Advisory Group. We've just put through three new codes, which. It looks like, now for whatever you want to say about the current administration, they're very telehealth friendly. Uh, the, the person who's running CMS now is the most telehealth friendly person we've seen in history. And it looks like we're going to have three new codes in the 2019 fee schedule. One which will allow you, for instance, to exchange information between a specialist and a primary care doctor and both get paid just for a, like an electronic curbside. Uh, and then there are a couple of remote monitoring codes. So we're getting there on that. I, I think the, the future is quite bright on that, actually. The second question was about if if other industries were using uh, this kind of approach. And, and the example was tracking workers and then encouraging them to do more work based on their behavior. And I don't know about that. Um, I hadn't thought about it in that way, to be quite honest. I've thought about it more, and, and I think about retail a lot, where, as I said, retail is doing some amazing things to encourage us. So I, I tend to think about this, as, as you probably have already figured out, in the behavior change mode. I don't think what you described is really a very effective way to change behavior, um, and probably that's the reason I can't think of an example of, of someone doing that. But, but retail is doing all kinds of things to make it more compelling for you to change your behavior. An example that, that I like is uh, uh, if you buy something online from J. Crew and you have their app on your phone and you go to the store, it will direct you to a rack where there are accessories that match the thing you bought. Right? So, again, I know healthy behaviors, impulse purchases, not the same thing. I get that. But you can start to see a potential future where we could do a lot more, I think, interesting things to engage our patients digitally. And the last thing I'll say about it, 
this was pointed out to me by a very progressive health system in the Pacific Northwest, uh, and he, he, the guy came in and talked to us about what they're doing for digital, and he said that, and we, we see this where I live, we're, we're losing market share in commercial. So I think you all know what that means, right? Medicare doesn't pay all that well. Medicaid is a money loser. So commercial is a big, important thing. And the commercial patient is digital. And we've seen that over and over again. So we, we really have to rise to the occasion and make, frankly, make our services more like Uber and Lyft. The service is delivered by a person, but everything around it is much easier because of the mobile experience. I think that's the way we have to think of it. Last question, and of course, uh, I'm with an infectious disease, and so I see people that have sensitive diagnoses like HIV and other STDs. So I was wondering if that could track two things. One is uh, internet pornographic activity, and the other is promiscuous uh, sexual activity. You want to track those, is that what you're asking? <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah. Well, I think so. So, all kidding aside, all kidding aside, right? I'm thinking on my feet here, but but you do see, for instance, as you know, that Google and Facebook and others have been doing things with flu epidemics for a long time now. So, there's you you could certainly aggregate data at a population level where certain individuals were congregating and, and maybe start to get at it from that at a, at a group level. I don't know that you could do it at an individual level. Um, unless you had a smart condom, maybe. <laughs> hey! It's the Internet of Things. Okay.